Hey guys, the objective of this video is to look at the analysis process according to AS3600, where we go from strain to stress to force. We're then going to be talking about the equivalent rectangular stress block, and then we're going to be talking about the equivalent, sorry, the effective width. So, what the code is going to be giving us in AS3600 is going to be maximum values of strain. Now, the reason they do that is twofold. The first is, they can't give us values of stress because our stress is going to vary depending on the material. So for example, in concrete, we could be given different stresses of uh, characteristic stresses of uh, 32 MPA, 40 MPA, 60 MPA. It's, it's, very, it's varying dependent on the material. And also the same, the same is true for the steel. We could be given 300, 400, 500 MPA yield stress steel. So the stress isn't consistent. The strain is though. A good thing about the strain as well is that because the steel and concrete behave composite, compositely, um, they're going to uh, reduce and increase in length by the same amount. So their strains are going to be the same. They deform the same because they're bound together. So the code is going to give us maximum values of strain. Based on this strain and uh, the elastic modulus of the steel only, we can work out the stress in the steel. Now, the reason we can only do that for steel is because it's a linear material. So this formula only holds for linear materials. The stress in the concrete is going to be given to us in the code. It's going to tell us the stress. Okay. Now, we can go for both the stress and the, the stress, the steel and the concrete. We can go from stress to force just by multiplying by the area. Okay, so this is going to be sort of the process to work out the uh, forces in our um, in our section. So we go from strain to stress to force. Just to show you graphically now, and we're going to talk about the equivalent rectangular stress block. I'm going to go through this progression very slowly. So the first thing is just our section. So our section has a width b and a depth d. Uh, for this example, I'm looking at the section in sagging. So if I bend my ruler, the bottom part's in tension and the top part's in compression. The neutral axis occurs at the interface between the cracked and uncracked sections. Now, as I said, we start off with strain. So the code's going to give us a particular value of maximum strain, and we put that in the extreme compressive fiber. So extreme compressive fiber means as far away from the neutral axis as possible. So this edge there is the extreme compressive fiber. The code is going to give us a particular value of strain, which is the maximum. Okay. We can then draw the strain diagram, which is just linearly because it, uh, the steel and concrete behave compositely. compositely. Um, we can then just call that value the strain in the steel. We don't know what that is just yet. And the code tells us that the depth from the extreme compressive fiber to the neutral axis, so that depth there, is given by this uh, term k subscript u d. d is the full depth, and k u is just going to be a factor which reduces it. Okay, and I'm only in my videos for most of the part. Uh, simplify k u d just to d subscript n, where n stands for neutral axis. Okay, so d subscript n is the same as k u d. Then we go from strain to stress. Okay, so as I said, the uh, we can work out the stress in the steel by just multiplying the strain by the elastic modulus. So that will give us the stress in the steel, the tensile steel down there. And as I said, the stress in the concrete is given to us in the code. It's given to us as alpha 2 FC dash. So alpha 2, we're going to talk about what these terms mean just in a second. But it's given to us as alpha 2 FC dash. And its depth is gamma dn. Okay, so it's another factor times by the neutral axis, shifting it up a bit. And we call this the equivalent rectangular stress block. And the reason is, is because in reality, We've said that the concrete is nonlinear, which means that our stress distribution would look more like this black line here. Okay, it's going to be okay that red line here. It's going to be nonlinear stress distribution in the concrete. And what the code does is it manipulates this non nonlinear stress distribution into an equivalent block, into equivalent rectangle. Okay. Um, just to show you, for the, if we had a steel I beam, the stress distribution is just going to be linear. Where in concrete, it's not going to be linear. It's non-linear, the stress distribution, which they make into, the code makes it into, manipulates the, um, the profile into a rectangular stress block. And it's called the equivalent rectangular stress block. So there it is. It's given by alpha 2 FC dash, which is the stress. And it's got a depth of gamma dn. We're going to talk about how to find all these terms later. I just want to show you graphically what it looks like. And then we've got our stress in the... Um, the steel down here. The, the last thing we want to do is we're going to go from stress to force by multiplying by the area and we'll get the compression in the concrete and the tension in the steel. Now students tend to get a bit confused going from stress to force for the concrete. So let me show you a nice little picture which will help you out. So alpha 2 FC dash is, the, is literally just the stress. Okay, so it's going to be an MPA value. 
alpha 2 fc dash which will be given to us in the code how to find alpha 2 fc dash will just be the strength of the concrete so that's going to be mpa now that stress acts over the width of our section b and it acts over the depth gamma dn so b gamma dn we know that the compression or force is stress times area so the stress is alpha 2 fc dash the area is b times gamma dn okay and that will give us the compression in the concrete so just look this picture is very helpful to sort of simplify what's going on and the last thing we need to talk about now is just the effective width so for a t-beam and l-beam these are these are special cases and the reason is because when we have a structure we tend to have a beam and a slab and they act as one one section okay so we have a floor slab and a beam and this is a floor slab and a beam at the end of a building all right so we have l-beams and t-beams they're quite common in concrete structures and we say that the effective width which is the width that the um, steel section, the concrete section is actually able to take. So if this extended very, very long, it's not gonna, the concrete out the far sides is not going to do anything. It's not helping us. It's only over a certain width that the concrete is able to take moment or something like that. So we call that the effective width. It's given by this formula here for T-beams and this formula here for L-beams. We're going to be doing an example in the next video where I actually worked it out. So I just wanted to introduce the concept of an effective width. Um, for T-beams and L-beams, these formulas here. Don't worry so much about what they mean just now. We're going to be seeing that in the next video. I just want you to in understand the concept that the, con the if the concrete was infinitely long, that way, it's not going to be able to handle moment. It's too far out the side. It can only handle force and moment over a certain width, an effective width. Anyway, guys, we'll see you in the next video, and I hope that helps.